Hey guys, and welcome to this CityJS podcast. My name is Dan, and I'm joined with my colleague Akash here. And we have some wonderful people working in the database world. So we have Jesse from Basura, we have Matteo from Platformatic, and we also have Adam from Methis. So today we're going to be talking about databases, how developers use them, what pain points they have, and where the future of databases is going as well. So I want to ask you guys an open question, and that is, why do developers not really care too much about databases, and how can we make them care more about databases? I guess that there are multiple reasons to that. First is people like always claim and all the tutorials, they tell you that, hey, you can just drop in something as your database, something as your ORM, and it's going to work, right? But the reality is things do not necessarily work like this and you may face some issues and then it's actually a very hard question what to do next. Should you replace the database? Maybe it's a fault of the ORM. Maybe you should just do a PhD of database internals, whatnot. So generally there's like an open-ended question at that point, but all it goes down to is like tooling and proper approach of figuring that out. It's like... I, I, I tend to, to subscribe to that, to that statement. Um, uh, typically... Uh, um, like you're storing the data, you need to store your data somewhere, okay? Either it's a file or it's a database. Well, to be honest, databases are actually uh, files as posed on a distributed system and then over a network. So it's just an abstraction. And you need to, uh, essentially, you need to understand what uh, how your primitives and what you're doing. All of those things are essentially, um, I call them leaky abstractions. So basically, you, you, are, you have these nice components that abstract your database somehow and simplify its operation for most of the uh, tradition, for, for most of the use cases. But then, if you don't know the underlying primitives that you are being, you are being abstracting out, when the uh, proverbial shit hit the fan, you are pretty much screwed because you don't know what to do at that point, because you don't know what's you don't know what's in the engine, you don't know how to, what's going on in there and you can't fix it. And ultimately you are um, responsible for your application, for the end user experience of your application or your API and so on. So um, it's, uh, uh, it's very typically very risky for uh, 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 when you know, a blog post or something tells you Oh, you are. You don't need to learn uh, SQL, or you don't need to use the native database driver, or you don't know what indexes look like, and what is a query plan, and how a join works, and the cost of the latency to do a query on the database. And if you're not thinking about all those things, uh, well, you can get away pretty much for for a long for small prototype, or small apps, but at some point that. The, the, that view of the world will crumple and then you are pretty much into uh, uh, and then you start blaming the world essentially. <laughs> so would you, would you say it's like death by abstraction and we have all these tools on top of databases that... Yeah, I, I want to roll back to the question you had there. It's a, it's a little bit less uh, that de the developers don't care about databases and more that developers have been trying to avoid them because I think that there's an inherent fear Especially with a lot of the rise of the of platform, if you will. So when you have a lot more front end developers versus back end educated developers, uh, there's a fear that you're going to just like either destroy the database, you're going to expose the database, or you're going to cause some kind of you know, catastrophic uh, access problem that will really have you know re repercussions for your company. And so with these abstractions that we're talking about, I think they've been trying to make data storage accessible, but not helping people understand what those principles are underneath it, like what Taylor was saying. And so when you're talking about, yeah, you know, just go ahead and throw whatever JSON object you want inside of a, inside of a document store. It's a really nice primitive until you realize actually relations were kind of nice or the object yeah. type no. enforced oh. some benefits. Oh. Look, yeah. it, it's uh, um, one of the most, um, requested features in, in uh, Platformatic uh, DB that we get is, when do you go into support MongoDB? Yeah. And, and then I, I wrote down... Because uh, why? Why do they want MongoDB support? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, <laughs> okay. So uh, I wrote down a plan. And the first plan is, okay, 
how can you abstract a schema out of a mongoless a, a schemaless <laughs> database? Yeah. Because that's what you need. You need yeah. a schema because you need to define how you're going to store your data proactively. And, and then it's just like, okay, so uh, there is a guide. There's a beautiful guide on the MongoDB website that explains you how to do that. Yeah. And I was looking at the guide, okay, that's step one. So I now we have an abstraction for that. I need to store that abstraction. So I have a schema on disk that I can read up and start up. Okay, we can ship MongoDB integration, but I'm just wondering, you want a, a schema from a schemaless database. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? I mean, it's, that's... it's like with this whole movement of NoSQL, no actually, yeah. when it started. Like people were fed up with database, SQL yeah. databases, because they are slow, you have transactions, yada, yada, you don't need that. Or your data model wasn't flexible because yeah, you yeah. back to creating data model initially. Yeah, but yeah. then you go with document databases, like with DynamoDB and, and the AWS, and you ask question, how do I mimic transactions? How do I do atomic operations and whatnot? Obviously, you find a ton of patterns uh, around the world on Stack Overflow and documentation, how to implement that. But then you should ask a question, this, maybe, this is maybe exactly I need SQL. Well. point though, right? Because we're now creating solutions to things that maybe shouldn't have been problems in the first place if people understood what was going on with the data model and databases in the first place. Or if they understood why they were choosing a NoSQL uh, no document store. There are places for document storage. But if people are trying to figure out how do I do transactions on a schemaless database, it's like, well, are you sure you wanted a document store? <laughs> yeah, exactly sure? right. Yeah. Exactly right. Part of that is because people are, just like we said before, you're like very encouraged not to care about the internals. Just drop in the database, just use it, right? But then when things go slow, you start figuring out how to implement those transactions, etc. because the features like MongoDB used to lose data, right? Read committed in SQL databases shows you that you can like skip rows or have duplicates, etc. Perfectly fine according to the SQL standard, right? No, not the standard <laughs> to the implementation. Actually, for we do have a great <laughs> book here. We do have a great book. We do have so. a great book here. Uh, learn SQL. If you want to learn <laughs> databases well, have a look. This is a great one. I've been going through databases in depth. I'm not related to this at all. I'm not even all the way through the book. But uh, relational theory for practitioners, which he goes on to the point of like duplicate rows. Not actually anywhere in relational theory, not anywhere in the SQL yeah, standard, yeah. but the SQL implementation has given the concession for it, which has actually allowed for the rise of some bad practices and everything else. There is uh, another good guide that was just released from the folks at Planet, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Planet Scale uh, about uh, uh, my SQL guide. It's amazing. Check it out. Yeah, yeah. So it just free. Learn, it's free. learn what I'm saying is. Um, uh, Learn the basics. Learn, learn the, the basics. Learn the foundation. Learn, the foundation. learn yeah. enough to know, to move yourself, so, to know enough to be able to uh, uh, get yourself out of the problems yeah. when, when they arise. Okay? Yeah, I just want to say, from a Hussura's perspective, talking to customers who are constantly trying to come in and figure out, why is my query slow? And it's like, like oh yeah, the engine must be doing something wrong if you're not, this is totally non-related, but like the engine basically just writes SQL from the queries you write. And it's like, no, actually, it's your database. In almost every case, it's the database because somebody's trying to query across a whole bunch of rows with no primary index. Yeah. Or yeah. with no, like, no, like doing a full table scan uh, and then joining on another full table scan. So Look, I, I, I was, yeah. um, uh, uh, before starting Platformatic, I was a consultant at a company called, called Near Firm. And one of our clients um, had uh, this, uh, this phenomenal operation that in order to make it um, atomic of uh, in order to make atomic across all the servers, they were locking the full table. <laughs> Works kind of <laughs> slow. <laughs> and then they Take were time, yeah. <laughs> they were complaining that everything was super slow. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's, it's just, <laughs> just can't believe that. But just like you mentioned, like okay, you have those internals of everything, but you you may be missing an index, something like this. And this is what we try to tackle in Matis directly, right? Not only you, it's good if you understand all the internals, but it's great if you have everything, like all the pieces at once presented to you. If you have good tooling showing to you that hey, those are the things that are happening, those are the indexes that you are missing. This is maybe something you should suggest. Sure, because any on any of us, like all the developers can 
master the databases and can then spend like hours figuring out, do I have index here? Do I have correct schema over there, et cetera, et cetera. But the good tooling should support you out of the box, and this applies to every yeah, database, is, showing you yeah. what you miss and how to remediate that as soon as possible, right? This is really key going back to the original question of why the developers not care. It's not that they didn't, didn't care, it's so that they were you know, cautious. And I think it's because there, were, there was so much complexity and risk involved with trying to access the database that today there is enough tooling, there is enough abstractions that have been helpful. I would argue, I think you would say too, that GraphQL is a helpful one for relational uh, databases uh, and, and for some um, document stores too. And that there's tooling for access patterns, observability, what's yeah. slow, what's not slow. So the thing is, is like, there's actually tools out there then make this approachable and accessible. So developers really need to come back to and say, yeah, the tooling, the abstractions are helpful for doing these things at scale, but you still need to understand underneath all of it what you're actually doing. Like it's kind of like writing, um, writing React code without understanding JavaScript, right? It's like you really need to understand JavaScript before you can like properly benefit from the abstraction. I, I like the, the trend though, it's a lot of people who, who Counterclaim yeah, that they're wrong. That, but, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, that is um, ultimately it's uh, uh, it's a journey. Okay, yeah, and uh, uh, you can't learn all the things at the same time, and you need to focus on learning the things that you need to ship to ship your product. Fair. The fundamental bit is not be scared of the database drivers. Don't be scared of running at the lowest level of what you can do with your database. Um, ultimately, I, 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 you know, ultimately, in order to use your database at its best, you actually have to use some custom SQL to, to get the things, or some custom views, or some custom indexes, or some... You Aggregations, need to, right, or something like that. You need to do something there, okay? You need to write some custom... Uh, you need to know exactly what are the queries that you're going to execute and how to, they are being unrolled. And most of the time, it's, uh, um, it's very hard for, uh, uh, you know, for machines to generate those things automatically, efficiently, but not because the machines are not good, mostly because your scheme is not good. But you can't really optimize your, it's very hard to optimize, to, to structure your, your schema correctly for being queried if you don't know how to query the thing. So it's... Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, if you're working on an abstraction, right, you've got like a schema, like a higher level above SQL. Yeah. And then, then you, you don't even care about the SQL at that point. Right? You're not exactly. Thinking, you're, yeah. not, you're not think like... Think about relational theory. Think about the yeah. connection. Think about the data model. It, think about the data model, okay? Think about the fact that uh, if you need to set up a query, you need to, you will uh, at some point uh, need to uh, duplicate certain amount of data in your schema. And a lot of people, a lot of theories, database theory and relational database theory tells us, oh, no, no, you need to normalize your schema. And this was basically the mantra for when I was at uni and uh, at schools and everything. It's bullshit. Okay, I'm going to tell it. It's total bullshit. You should absolutely, you should not focus on normalizing your schema. You should focus yourself on having good access pattern for your data. Yeah, having a normal schema, not a normalized database. So yes. How is, what's a reasonable way and a reasonable yes. way to reason about what your schema is? Yeah, so you start, typically you start from a, a normalized schema, but then when you start having a query and you need, in order to get the data, you need to join five tables yeah. to get that data. I'm just, don't do that, okay? Just put the information that you need where you need it and that's it. And then you will need to go and update it. But most of the time, it's not the case. Typically, you just need, oh, uh, recently we had the discussion in, uh, in my team at Platformatic uh, when we were building our cloud. And it's, uh, it was like we needed the, at some point, we need the, uh, uh, we call the workspace ID in, in an entity. And it, it didn't have a, a direct link, but it, you could walk, literally walk up five joints to get that information. Just say, but and then we got in an argument with, with, uh, with one of our devs and they were saying, look, um, but this is not normalized, okay? So we should only put it there. Well, but there's no chance this value is ever going to change. So the, the, this entity cannot be changed. Can, this value is once it's, it's, it's set there, it's not, nobody's going to change it in the app. So it's totally fine to duplicate this information uh, uh, everywhere. And then instead of doing all this massive query to validate the data, we can just, you know, do it in one, in, in, in one go, 
And that automatically simplified all the operation of, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 of our product. And, but you need to be reasoning at this kind of level when you're designing your, your database. And what's the, what's the thing you're trying to solve for? What you could yeah. be the five levels and, of organizations, and, what you need. It could be. Yes, I, I, I am sorry, it's, I'm not. It's not, rare. I, 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 don't, I, 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 I disagree <laughs> on that. This, this, is, this is a good thing for you, right? Yeah. Because you're building a tool that generates SQL for you uh, on the spectrum of ORMs. And Matteo, you mentioned in your talk today that you would never use an ORM. Yeah. And coming full circle, we're, we're speaking about understanding the 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 generated SQL that's been generated. Yeah. And that's why you need to have a good tooling around showing you what's going on. I feel like we are running in circles of software engineering for many years because like, it's always safe to say, normalize your database, your schema, because then if you have duplicates, you avoid that, right? But when you go, you need to understand, more importantly, it's not about understanding the database, but it's understanding your access patterns and your schemas and what you're doing in your business. Yeah. And because of that, like due to, what your access patterns are, this is how you should structure data. If you know that, okay, duplicates are a problem, but you know that you won't have duplicates here or that duplicating data is okay because it's not going to change, as you mentioned, right? Then it's perfectly fine and you don't need to normalize or denormalize in such a case, right? It's, uh, um, this is one of the, so my, my most uh, uh, hated library in the node world is Mongoose. <laughs> okay, I consider Mongoose the source of all evil in the node community, close to. Okay. I love it, the populate method, right? That's yeah, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, basically that method is... is, is uh, join, but for the NoSQL word, I guess. It's, it's uh, oh, we wanted the join, and we think our join is, is better done inside the process versus inside the database. And I'm just like, I don't think you have read enough computer science. Folks, that this is, there is a, some physics limitation to what you're trying to do. And please don't, don't, don't use that method at all. Anyway, Mongoose has this populate method. So you have, in MongoDB, you can have two collections. And if you want to relate them and load the data between them, Mongoose after this nice abstraction, and you create those two models, and then you can use populate to, to read between the two. Um, it's, an, it's, a, it's a solution to destroy the performance of your MongoDB <laughs> database. Uh, and it's exactly the wrong way to approach MongoDB, for example, uh, because it says you, you, model, you model the data with, uh, 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 with your collections, and then you go and read the, um, you go and, uh, uh, and access it in any possible way which every single tutorial or discussion that you will, every single discussion, official documentation or discussion that will tell you from the MongoDB, uh, from MongoDB itself, will tell you that the way to approach MongoDB or any other NoSQL is to start, how, how are you going to query the data? And you need to start with that. And I kind of recognize the fact that the NoSQL mo movement brought that intention back and brought and put that on the spotlight. And a lot of the new features that originated from, from that world that shipped recently in the last few releases of, for example, PostgreSQL or MariaDB, all fall into the direction of um, provi providing better, to some extent, um, denormalized uh, yeah. uh, access patterns for, for your yeah. data. So storing JSON, retrieving for JSON. Example, for things. example, storing JSON when you need it, because in some cases you have freeform data. So yeah, if, yeah. If, yeah there, is, there is just one challenge whenever I hear a reason like this, which is perfectly fine, but data access patterns change over time. And it's just like walking on the water. It's easy as long as the water is frozen and the requirements are frozen, right? Our applications evolve over time, starting a database with some data access patterns this is perfectly fine, but we need to also constantly monitor and observe how it's going yeah, improve behind it, the scenes. Yeah, it. constantly improve. It's like kind of refactoring, even though we change the schema upside down to connect yes. all of that, right? But it's not like, you know, hit and run. It's not that you compose your database once and you are done. It's nothing like this. You always need to see how the data evolves, how your business requirements change, what other like uh, access patterns they are like becoming obsolete and whatnot. And for that, again, you need to have both 
good knowledge, understanding of how to do it behind the scenes, and also very good platform tooling and whatnot, yeah, showing you performance, live metrics, traces, hotel, whatnot, just to see behind the scenes, right? Uh, open, hotel is open telemetry for yeah. you that you're watching that yeah. you don't know, so. I, I just kind of want to, <laughs> just kind of want to put a, put a bit of a bow on that too. And I think it just really does come down to, you're going to not have performant applications, you're not going to have a good experience as a developer if you don't understand the data you have and what it is you're trying to do with it. And so learn the principles, learn what the application is that your goal is, figure out what, what the application you want to build will dictate your access pattern, which will dictate your storage, which will dictate a lot about everything else that you're going to choose from there. So start with your data, understand your data and your data storage. Don't be afraid of it because there's a lot of tooling out there that actually makes it easy to work with. But if there's anything, and I'll, I'm speaking as somebody who avoided databases for years, I am a, I am a flat file magician. <laughs> um, as somebody who has avoided databases for years, learn the database because it really will be your friend and that will help you make much, much better decisions and have much better apps and your users are going to be benefiting from that. It's kind of how I put a bow on it. So hundred percent agree. Starting from the beginning, if you're building an application from the beginning, but what about if you know, you're just joined a team and it's already a production database, then how would you tackle um, you know, changing the queries and the schema and the access patterns around that? It's very, it's very hard, okay, in that sense, especially if the team, it's, if the application itself is very old or it's a decade, it's a, let's say a, a case where an application is a decade old. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have an, an app that's, that's uh, it's been around for a, for, uh, uh, for a few years and it typically has no tests. It's a big monolith with, I don't know, 50, tab 50 to 200 tables uh, nested together. And yeah, done, tables eight letters long, uh, naming yeah, is such, it's, as it's, always. It makes no sense. <laughs> and in those cases, you are, are, are actually, you are actually in trouble, okay? And uh, the typical case for those is you need to, the problem for that is not a database. That's an organization. It's an, you typically, you move from- Conway the, Law. You, get, you move to, you already know, you're the best friend. <laughs> you know, we are, we, are, we, are, we are on the same page. So basically you move from the problem from databases to the problem of people. And uh, uh, to change is the process, the development process that gets you there. And the fact that, look, if you have such a big database with so many tables, you are probably doing it wrong. And you should think a little bit about, okay, I have my database schema. I have my teams, because at this point you will have multiple teams, because if you have 200 tables, you have multiple teams working on it. And you need multiple, you have multiple teams. You need to move to uh, think about moving to breaking that thing into multiple microservices and then destroy, move, move, putting them up with some level of uh, either an API gateway or a, a GraphQL Federation, Apollo Federation on top, and have all those interaction built in so that otherwise you, you will not, um, it will be very hard to get yourself out from that specific uh, problem. You need to move one level up because it's, uh, when you reach that stage, you have a legacy system and you need to think of how I'm going to strangle that monolith and move to either lambdas, serverless or microservices, or even a modular monolith to begin with. But you need to have, uh, uh, you need to start breaking the, yeah, the relations. Yeah, bounded context. Uh, yeah. Creating bounded context. These are good term uh, from the domain driven design work to, to, to isolate certain parts of the database so that they can be now controlled via API. And here we make a great loop because we extract those bounded contexts. It means that we may like purposefully duplicate some data yeah. between yeah. those data storages, yeah. right? And that's perfectly as designed. And I, I, I'll, I'm not a sure guy, but I'm gonna go ahead and give one, one benefit to Apollo here. Um, and they actually advocate, and this is, the right, this is the right thing to do, is you need a data layer, data layer owner at the company. If you're in a situation where everything's in absolute chaos, you need somebody whose job it is to actually understand the data interface across your organization. And if you implement that kind of a role, that's going to be somebody who works cross boundaries and be able to help kind of break these things down into these sort of subdomains and bounded contexts. Then you're going to be able to start to do it because it's kind of, I mean, how do you eat an elephant, they say, is 
one bite at a time. Yeah. So it's just uh, you start somewhere, but you have to figure out one person. If you have one person that you can dedicate to this issue, I keep uh, And it goes the opposite as well. If you do not have someone who takes care of all of that, and you mess up your domain model, then I, um, yeah. The, uh, there are a few techniques that can like, that I don't buy that data the owner, owner the data owner thing. It, I think it's I'm a, an architect. I love data. I I I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't like gatekeeping as a generic topic. Okay, uh, there are other techniques to uh, isolate components. So um, uh, one of it, I don't know if you have ever uh, watched it, but I recommend it. It's uh, um, uh, Alberto Brandolini's uh, event storming yeah. technique. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a way for doing system modeling uh, based on uh, business events. Mm -hmm. So you could do that, model your business in terms of business events, and then from there, the bounded context emerges more or less naturally, and you know where there is group of business functions that sits together, okay, you can cluster them. And at that point in time, you define, oh, I need some sort of components here to map this part of the business process into uh, uh, an API or, or some layer, and then it's actually very easy to yeah, move from yeah. there, from, from from there up. And then we can run into other issues, which is a completely different story. So it's not the only pattern. Yeah, we can yeah, use no, the only uh, technique. The, 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 yeah. There are what yeah. I was yeah. trying to say. Yeah, yeah. There are multiple techniques that are fine that are available in the in the field yeah, to, yeah. to break, just to break that to yeah. break this up. I another stuff that I used to do quite a lot is and an essentially what we do is uh, an architect, uh, um, is an, uh, another kind of live workshop type of thing where we go through the basic uh, architecture of, of the application, trying to understand the function, and reverse engineer. Essentially, it's to some extent, it's very close to a reverse event storming. In, in <laughs> yeah. if, you, if, you, if you look from what you have and go up. Yeah. But so what it, what it really sounds like is that at CityJS Berlin, there will actually be eating the data spaghetti with Matteo as a workshop. Oh, <laughs> like look, I am, um, look, I... That's from like that multiple plates it, because so we don't want to have separate now, bandwidth. I don't know when the city just Berlin is because I need to go book flights. So... <laughs> <laughs> 18th of August, August. city just Berlin. Uh, I want to see you there. Somebody <laughs> I'm on vacation.